Okay, so uh, you learned about row hammer very briefly in uh, a couple of earlier lectures, but now we're going to go and do a deep dive into this problem. Uh, as I said, because it's just fascinating that uh, this problem uh, has been discovered uh, recently and it still has not been solved yet. That's the interesting part, right? I was actually expecting this problem to be a non-problem at this point so that we could talk about as history but it's, it's actually much less of an history, but it's going to bother us for some time going into the future because it's fundamental in the end, but I think uh, at least it should have been solved uh, in, the, in the field at this point, uh, after six years after our original paper, basically. But I mean, the problem itself, the read disturbance issue is a fundamental uh, failure mechanism that exists in pretty much all memories. And we will discuss uh, both the fundamental aspects as well as uh, maybe speculate on why it has not been solved yet. That's why I think it's fascinating. There's clearly it's a fundamental problem. It caused a reliability and security issue. And you would expect it would have been solved by now. And many people expect it would have been solved by now, actually, not just, not just me or someone else, but many people, yet it has not been solved. So we, maybe we can discuss why it has not been solved also. Okay, so basically this is an example of this first a key direction over here, which is building hopefully fundamentally secure, reliable, and safe uh, architectures. And I, as I said, I put these uh, together over here uh, uh, because I think your hammer is a really good example of something that affects your security, reliability, and safety at the same time. Okay, and let's talk about that. And I think that's really important. And I wanted to start with this because this is really uh, the basis of everything else. And I, uh, essentially, if you're not secure, reliable, and safe, maybe you cannot build anything else that's really interesting on top of that, right? So basically, uh, what's, what's row hammer? Again, it's one can predictably induce bit flips in commodity DRAM chips. It's that phenomenon. And uh, when we first tested our DRAM chips, uh, when we wrote the first paper on it, uh, more than 80% of the tested DRAM chips were found to be vulnerable. And surprisingly, in our latest paper in 2020, which I'm also going to talk about, that number still remains the same. Uh, and this is really interesting because as far as I know, this is really the first example of how a simple hardware failure mechanism at the circuit level can create a widespread system security vulnerability. So people actually were interested in connections of hardware failures at the circuit level, like bit flips, et cetera, uh, and uh, security for some time, no question about that. And I'm gonna actually talk, to, talk about a paper later on. Uh, but Rohammer really shows how this can actually be real with a simple hardware failure mechanism and people can actually devise real attacks. Uh, and it's really a simple hardware failure mechanism actually. It's not something sophisticated, something hard to understand. You don't need to have physical access to a machine to actually induce this hardware failure mechanism. You can do it from the software. You can do it remotely. You don't need to have user privileges. So basically it's, it, it enables an attack that uh, no other hardware failure mechanism that I know of uh, has enabled. I'm not talking about hardware bugs. It's really a failure mechanism. Uh, hardware bugs are actually also very interesting. Basically, some, uh, some part of the hardware uh, is buggy in the sense that uh, uh, let's assume that uh, your coherence protocol is buggy for some reason uh, and somebody exploits it. Uh, I think usually those don't tend to be simple. Those tend to actually, hardware bugs uh, tend to uh, actually manifest themselves in very sophisticated conditions, uh, meaning you, it's very hard to replicate. Uh, but uh, Rohammer is different. Some people call Rohammer a bug. Uh, I mean, at some level, maybe you can think of it as a bug, but fundamentally, it's a reliability issue. If you're coming from a dependable computing, reliable computing perspective, it's really a fault that happens in circuit. And there are good reasons for why it happens, as we will discuss. It's, it's really a hardware failure mechanism. It's really uh, not a bug in the sense that uh, uh, it's, 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 it's not an oversight. It happens in all scaled circuits. It happens in flash memory, for example. The oversight is in the fact that it, gets ex it, it got exposed, in my opinion. Maybe, maybe oversight is not a good word, but basically uh, the fact that it got exposed enabled all these attacks, no question about that. But uh, it's, uh, fundamentally, it's not a bug. It's really hard, uh, fundamentally, it's a hardware failure mechanism. Okay, and as a result, I showed you this picture before. People are now devising attacks and writing uh, interesting position uh, papers like this. Forget software, hackers are exploiting physics. Okay, so let me actually uh, give you a broader perspective 
uh, which is really based on uh, this, uh, this person who is Abraham Maslow, who, who was a very prominent uh, psychologist. Uh, and he actually dedicated his life to understanding why humans do the things they do. Uh, and uh, he, essentially, he wrote this beautiful article, which eventually resulted in a book of his lifetime, let's say. Uh, and basically, he basically came up with a theory of uh, how humans get motivated to do things that they are doing. And he basically uh, is probably more famous for this hierarchy of needs, which has impacted a lot of fields, economics, uh, psychology, sociology, uh, etc., cetera, uh, uh, and uh, politics also, actually. Basically, uh, what this says is, uh, in order to be motivated to do something uh, like highest forms of abstract art, you basically need all of your prior levels of needs satisfied. And you have some basic needs, like physiological needs and safety needs. And if you don't have those satisfied, you're not going to think about abstract art, for example. And that's why I think reliability and security is extremely important also. If we don't have a reliable and secure computing system, then maybe it's really not that interesting to talk about something uh, that's, uh, that's at the higher levels over here. Okay, essentially, uh, we're building infrastructure for the future. All of the computing devices are actually being used in all of our, uh, essentially all aspects of our lives almost, right? And some of them are actually used for really, really important safety critical aspects like driving or uh, like self-driving cars is one example. And there are many other examples. We're, we're going to basically increasingly rely on these devices to make decisions for us. And some of those are safety critical. Some of them are health critical. We talked about genomics last time. Uh, if you don't have a safe device that can make good decisions for your health, yes, maybe immediately it's not a, it's not a security threat, but maybe it's a long-term health threat, right? So we, we, we are going to rely on this infrastructure that's very much based on let's say machine learning, genomics, anything, the applications that we're going to help our lives. If we have actually bit flips in this infrastructure, then we're going to, solve, uh, we're going to have a lot of problems faced. And I, I, I liken these bit flips that we're going to get to uh, building architecture also. Well, in this case, it's not a building, it's a bridge, for example. And this is a bridge that uh, I know very well because I used to live around the area where this bridge used to be. I never crossed this bridge because this is what happened to this bridge six months after its construction. This is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, very close to Seattle. Uh, and essentially it's over the Hood Canal. And after uh, it was constructed, uh, because of aerostatic flutter, it was called the Galloping Gurdy, meaning it was doing a galloping action like this uh, in the bridge. And uh, people were trying to figure out how, how they could fix it, but they couldn't fix it. As a result, at some point, it's broke like this. And there are interesting videos of it that you can watch online also. Uh, but uh, the, I use this analogy because this is critical infrastructure, clearly. And it was not designed well or not designed with security, safety, reliability in the perfect perspective. And as a result, it caused a reliability, security, and safety. And also an availability problem, right? Because it's, you cannot cross uh, these two pieces of land, the Hood Canal, uh, uh, while the bridge is in this condition. So that's the idea over here. Basically, uh, I think of security as in a broader view. And if critical infrastructure is like this, bridges, okay, they're critical infrastructure and they're considered critical. They're interesting, but they're local, right? Whereas computing devices, they're everywhere, right? Bridges are not everywhere, frankly. Uh, computing devices are going to be everywhere and they're already everywhere, some of them. Uh, and as a result, uh, they're going to be even more critical infrastructure. So we should be even more careful in designing them compared to how we design our bridges. And how secure are these fields? This is another thing that I use actually as an example of motivating the importance of security in computing and in hardware specifically. Basically, these people are sitting on a hopefully strong piece of rod while they're constructing Manhattan after the World War. But, and they're happy as you can see, they don't care. But uh, if there's a bit flip on this rod, uh, they may not be very happy very soon after, right? And uh, I think, again, this is another critical infrastructure that people rely on. And I think existing computers are like that also. And I think of security as a, a very broadly, basically I think of security as uh, preventing, is all about preventing unforeseen consequences. And I actually believe in this. Uh, basically, if you really want to be secure, you really want to prevent uh, some unforeseen consequences that may happen with, let's say the devices that you built or uh, with anything that you're trying to do uh, this is a very broad definition, clearly, 
But if you take this broad approach, then you can be much more secure compared to if you don't take this broad approach. If you think about security as fixing bugs after they're discovered, that's not a good definition of security. If you think about security as obscuring as much as possible the problems that are out there until they're discovered, that's again a not good definition of security because there will always be people who can find out. There are always a lot of smart and creative people who can find out obscure stuff, especially if it's interesting and important, right? So I think security is, is better defined uh, as preventing something that you do not even foresee. And then you take actions to design your systems such that those systems are fixable, adaptable, when some consequences that you haven't foreseen have actually happened. And I think of flexible hardware, intelligent hardware, configurable or reconfigurable hardware as an example of patchable hardware, as an example of something that can prevent unforeseen consequences. Of course, it's always good to foresee consequences as much as possible to begin with, but I do not think that's perfectly possible because there are so many consequences. And again, the state space is huge. It's very difficult to actually build a model that could foresee all the consequences, even if you knew how to build that model, uh, at least in a small scale. Okay, so I keep this in mind, basically. I think we're gonna talk about hardware security issues and a particular hardware security issue called Rowhammer, which is, fundamentally rooted in a reliability and failure problem. Uh, but in the end, we need to solve such problems and such problems may occur into the future even more because of uh, the scaling problems that we have with circuits, not just memory, but circuits in general and devices also. Uh, then the question is how do we actually keep hardware secure? I think uh, this uh, line over here is very important. And I think the next thing is probably openness, somehow enabling open source uh, sharing of hardware and uh, as a result, enabling uh, a, an attack and defense culture openly such that you can fix these problems as much as possible without obscuring them is probably a good idea. And everything I said is actually uh, going against uh, how DRAM manufacturers want to keep, keep DRAM as, as closed as possible. And as a result, we have the problems that we have six years later after uh, Rohammer was exposed. Okay. Uh, Okay, so basically we're gonna talk about the DRAM scaling problem and you've seen this picture earlier. I'm gonna cover this briefly again. Basically any type of memory, uh, basically again, this is a, a, a scaling problem particular to DRAM, but any type of memory has scaling problems as you reduce the feature size. In case of DRAM, the DRAM is charge-based memory. It stores charge in this capacitor and it requires this access transistor and the bit line in the sense amplifier to be able to access and make sense of that charge basically. And this capacitor, and both all of these structures need to work reliably for DRAM to work. This capacitor must be large enough for reliable sensing. It needs to store enough electrons, for example, as we discussed last time. And this access transistor must be large enough for low leakage and high retention time. And as you know, and from the previous lecture, reducing the size or feature size of the circuit below some nanometers is challenging. And clearly it was challenging below 35 nanometers. As we discussed last time today, we're at 16, 17 nanometers, but it came at a cost. It was difficult to scale, no question about that from a manufacturing point of view. Uh, and maybe we didn't gain enough energy and power and it came at, cost, uh, at the cost of refresh. We needed to add error correcting codes in some of the cutting edge DRAMs as we will later discuss also uh, to handle issues like variable retention time, which we also discussed. But we were able to scale, but it came at a cost that was even worse perhaps, which is the Rohammer problem. And we discussed this last time uh, there's clear evidence in the field that as you scale memory to higher densities, uh, it correlates with your error rates that are observed in real production data centers across huge amounts of machines and huge amounts of memory. Okay, so and also as I discussed in past two lectures, we have built infrastructure to understand these issues and these are FPGA based infrastructures to test different memory chips. And as I mentioned, we built this infrastructure to test retention times early on and we actually published these papers that had retention time testing. And then later we figured out, oh, this infrastructure could be used for many, many other things. Why did we start with retention times? As I mentioned, refresh is a major scaling problem in DRAM. And we believe that we should really solve the refresh problem to solve the scaling problem in DRAM. And later we figured out other scaling problems like latency. So we looked at latency a lot and we're gonna talk about that later. But we also looked at read disturb issues in memory uh, which is what we're going to talk about right now. 
and this is the infrastructure where we did a lot of the Rohammer studies. And then, uh, as I mentioned last time, we open sourced this infrastructure. It's called SoftMC now. It works with DDR3 chips, and Hassan made it flexible, uh, easy to use, and open source. So it has a C++ API. Uh, and we actually have a, a projects and seminar course uh, on SoftMC. If, if you're a bachelor's student and if you're interested in taking it, uh, if you're excited about taking it, uh, you're, you're feel free to take it. I guess you cannot take it this semester, but you can take it next semester if, if it fits your schedule. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things can, you can do with this sort of infrastructure because now you can actually test uh, any type of memory you can plug into this FPGA board uh, with and we have a DDR4 version that's not publicly released yet. So if you take the course, you would be actually working on the infrastructure with DDR4 version that's not publicly released uh, uh, and contributing to hopefully a public release as well. Uh, but you can actually test a lot of things. And as, as we mentioned in the data retention, uh, lecture and refresh lecture, one of the things you could test and discover is the retention time profile of DRAM. And that leads to a lot of interesting ideas potentially as we, some of which we discussed in the lecture, right? Basically you can solve or you can take initially baby steps in solving the retention time problem by really understanding the retention time profile using this sort of infrastructure by testing DRAM chips. And then you can test other stuff and maybe you can test your solutions also. Okay, I'm not going to go further beyond the data retention. We already discussed that this data retention problem is not as easy as we, uh, as, as, as we initially thought it to be because data retention is location dependent, stored value dependent, time dependent. And uh, you're hopefully reading some of these papers that we discussed, especially if you're interested, I recommend prioritizing these papers, for example. But we did also write other papers on the topic, like how do we mitigate retention issues? I briefly, again, uh, went over them, but all of them actually use the infrastructure that I just showed you, uh, or a version of that infrastructure, uh, to deal with variable retention time issues, for example, uh, or data pattern dependence issues, and other data pattern dependence issues, and both of them at the same time, perhaps. Uh, and uh, looking at India and ECC, as I said, ECC is being added, uh, understanding that is important, and can we actually do better by understanding that? I mentioned this actually. This could also be a way of somehow identifying exact places where uh, bits have failed and maybe hopefully start correcting them. Somebody mentioned data recovery at the end of last lecture, right? I, I mentioned this paper, for example. So there are actually interesting potential things that you can do going into the future, as you can uh, see. Okay, so I'm talking about this because we built this infrastructure for retention time testing and understanding uh, retention times. And we've been using that clearly for getting rid of refresh as much as possible, built based on that understanding. And also more recently on understanding error correcting codes and maybe doing something better with them going into the future. Uh, but uh, the infrastructure is also useful for understanding other failure modes like read disturb. And while we were actually uh, working on this, we did this together with Intel and uh, we found out that uh, you can predictably induce errors in most DRAM memory chips. And again, this is not surprising because we had actually work on flash memory where we had a similar infrastructure. I'm gonna show that infrastructure later on, uh, where we uh, did examine flash memory for many different types of errors, including read disturb errors. So it doesn't take a huge leap to actually say, oh, there's read disturbance in flash memory. It manifests itself in a different way, of course, but essentially it's read disturbance. While you're reading one page, you're disturbing all of the other pages in the same block in flash memory. In fact, in flash memory, read disturbance is even worse. If we have flash memory lectures, you will see that uh, later on. Uh, and we actually quantified that, characterized it, and published about its experimental data early on. Uh, but uh, uh, in 2012, for example, uh, a, few, a couple of years before this paper. Uh, and it doesn't take a leap after that to think about, oh, why don't these errors also exist in DRAM? And we collaborated with Intel to actually look into those errors in DRAM. And we found out that, yes, they do exist in DRAM. And you can actually predictably induce these bit trips in most DRAM memory chips based on read disturbance. And as a result, it becomes a simple hardware failure mechanism that can create a widespread system security vulnerability. And as a result, you see uh, articles that look like this. So what is the problem? Basically, it's a disturbance error, as I said. Uh, whenever you're reading a row, you're disturbing physically adjacent rows. So in this case, let's assume that you're reading this row, opening this row, activating this row, Let's say, let's be more precise. Reading in this case means activate. You don't really need to issue a separate read to actually read something out of it. In DRAM, you can activate a row 
which brings the data into the row buffer as we discussed, right? And that's what we're going to do. This row, we're going to open it or activate it, which applies high voltage to the word line, right? Now let's assume that we do it repeatedly. Uh, and then we close the row, basically. Uh, we uh, apply low voltage. This is called a precharge in DM. Let's assume that we send these commands repeatedly. Activate, precharge, activate, precharge, activate, precharge, activate, precharge, activate, precharge. Enough times before the cells get refreshed. It turns out in most DRAM chips, the, some of the adjacent cells, physically adjacent cells in different rows, get bit flips. They basically move from zero to one or one to zero, depending on the encoding, but they essentially lose charge because there has been enough hammering that caused them to deplete their charge such that they're not readable in their original value that, were, that they were written as. So we call this the hammer rows. We call these the victim rows. And we basically show that most real DRAM chips are vulnerable to this sort of row hammer uh, phenomenon, failure mechanism. And most means more than 80%. Basically, these are three major DRAM manufacturers who shall remain nameless, but you can guess who they are. They're only three major DRAM manufacturers today. That's a bit unfortunate. It used to, the DRAM market used to be actually much more fractured. There used to be more manufacturers in the market, which, mean that, which meant that there was more innovation in the market. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, today, uh, things got more consolidated uh, into three major manufacturers, which have turned a lot more conservative uh, over, over the decades. And as a result, uh, they don't even like fixing problems. <laughs> let, me, let me put it that way, like Rolf Hammer. Okay, so basically, at the time we tested, you get more, the, more than 80% of the chips uh, that are uh, vulnerable. And this is a scaling problem. Uh, so why is this a scaling problem? Because... Uh, chips uh, that, that uh, well, uh, first of all, there's evidence in the field. Chips that we tested that were manufactured before 2010 did not exhibit this problem. First appearance is in 2010. And all of the chips that, we, that were manufactured in 2012 and 2013 that we tested were vulnerable. Okay, so this tells that there's a scaling problem. Things were not exposed uh, as bit flips earlier. Now, this also says something, basically, uh, in order to be able to induce these failures, you need to uh, uh, induce enough activates. You need to be able to do enough activates to a given row that's adjacent to vulnerable, row hammer vulnerable cells before the cells get refreshed. So in our paper, original paper, we showed that you needed to, let's say 139,000, let's say 140,000 activates within a refresh interval to induce bit flips. Now, uh, the reason these bit flips are happening is because you're causing disturbance, which means that the cells are too close to each other. Whenever you're actually dis uh, perturbing uh, uh, the, the word line of uh, one row by activation, you're perturbing the cells that are around that row. Now, if the cells are not too close to each other, you, don't need, to, uh, you need to do even more activates to enable bit flips like this. And in the past, like uh, let's assume that in 2008 and 2009, the number of activates you needed to do to be able to induce bit flips was too large. What does that mean? Basically, the number of activates wouldn't fit in the refresh interval, for example. Or maybe there's not enough number of activates that you can do to cause this disturbance. But over time, what happened is actually the number of activates that you needed to do to induce these bit flips kept reducing. And as a result, all of the chips became vulnerable. That's why this is a technology scaling problem. As you reduce the size of the cells, as you reduce the distance between the cells, what happens is cells become more vulnerable and the number of activates that you need to do to induce this read disturbance, row hammer failures, reduces. And I will show you uh, the data from 2020 later on. We will see that the number of activates has gone down to as small, as, as little as, uh, as few as 4,800 in double-sided row hammer. Okay, so what do I mean? I will talk about that also. Basically, okay, this is, this is interesting. Uh, it's a scaling problem because cells are getting closer to each other, essentially. Now, uh, this also doesn't mean that uh, the fact that you get zero here doesn't mean that, zero error rate doesn't mean that the module is not vulnerable. This is interesting because we are doing a particular type of row hammer testing, which is uh, really uh, attacking a single row in this case. We're hamming a single row, we're looking at what happens in the victim rows. But there are better row hammer testing that you can do that would increase the number of bit flips. So imagine that instead of hammering just this row, you hammer this row and then also this row over here. 
Now you have sandwiched one victim rope between two hammered ropes. And that caused a lot more disturbance on this victim rope, it turns out. And now you can actually find even more vulnerability and uh, cause a bit flip earlier. So you, didn't, you need to do an even smaller number of activates to call these errors. So that's the idea, basically. So we didn't do that testing over here. We, we said that, that that sort of testing actually leads to more errors. But later, actually, Google folks show that it does lead to even more errors. Uh, and they actually built their attacks based on that. This is called double-sided rope hammer. So uh, the takeaway is there could be better rope hammer attacks uh, by increasing the amount of disturbance uh, that you have on the vulnerable cells. And the fact that you get a zero error rate doesn't necessarily mean that the, cell, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the chip is not vulnerable. That could be one potential explanation. But another potential explanation is that you're not doing the worst case testing uh, that you should be doing to actually uncover the vulnerability in the chip. So essentially, zero error rate is not necessarily good news. That's, that's my point over here. Maybe the testing needs to be even more rigorous. OK, so I said a lot over here, but essentially, it's a scaling problem. And why is this happening? I think I gave you a glimpse. DM cells are too close to each other. As a result, they're not electrically isolated from each other. And one access to one cell affects the value in nearby cells due to electrical interference between the cells and the wires used for accessing the cells. And you know this very well, basically. Essentially, in retention time, uh, we, we know that retention time of cells are, got to get affected from each other's data values, right? It's a, it's a very similar type of electrical interference, but uh, essentially, why you leak is different in this case. It's also called cell-to-cell -cell coupling and interference. And for example, one, one intuitive way of thinking about it is, is this. I'm not saying the underlying circuit mechanisms exactly behave this way. There's some truth to it, but I think there's more, essentially. If you really want to know, you should really read the device level papers uh, about it. But basically, the intuitive example is when you activate or apply a high voltage to a, to a, to a row, an adjacent row gets slightly activated as well because it's very close. And as a result, vulnerable cells in that slightly activated row lose a little bit of charge. And if you do this repeated activation many, many times, or in other words, if row hammer happens enough times for that row, charge in adjacent such cells get drained. And as a result, you get a bit flip. And higher level implications is unfortunate, basically. The simple circuit level of failure mechanism has very large implications on upper levels of the transformation hierarchy. Basically, these bit flips that are happening over here get exposed to clearly the microarchitecture, but also they cut through and they get exposed to the programming language. Different from what happens in flash memory, because flash memory has a huge controller and a huge software stack, let's say, protecting it or enabling its access. In DRAM, a bit flip directly gets exposed to your data structures. Why your data structures are stored in memory, in physical memory, and you get a bit flip in physical memory. Now you get a data structure, a bit flip in your uh, data structure. It could be a program's data structure. It could be a hash table index, in which case, uh, I don't know, that will not work very well, perhaps. See? perhaps. But it, it could be also an operating system data structure, let's say a page table. It could be a bit that uh, indicates the permissions of a program to a particular location in memory. And if that bit gets flipped, the program now may get permissions to a location that it's not supposed to get permissions to. So it's, that's why it's a security problem, because it's directly affecting your data structures. And some data structures are really gating uh, secure access to other parts of the system. And that's how you can really exploit it as a security attack. Basically, this bit flip can be carefully placed in a data structure that is really gating or preventing access to some place that you're not supposed to access. And you induce bit flips to that data structure. And the data structure magically changes such that you can gain access to areas that you don't, uh, you're not supposed to gain access to. So that's the idea, basically. That's why this is a security problem. The other reason it's a security problem is because it's predictable. Meaning, if you cause a failure in a bit, you're going to cause it again and again and again, and again, and again, meaning it's repeatable. The bit flips are repeatable. That's important because uh, if this was a random bit flip, uh, it was, well, if it were occurring randomly, like variable retention time failures, for example, it would be much harder to exploit. You need to get lucky to exploit it, for example. It's possible to exploit it again, even if it's a random bit flip, uh, 
But if it's a predictable and repeatable bit flip, it's much easier to exploit. Basically, you figure out, you can, you can for example, uh, figure out vulnerable regions in the memory and say, okay, these are the bits that I know are vulnerable to hammer. Now let me try to flip them. You can have much targeted attacks, basically, uh, to memory. And we're going to talk briefly about that. There, 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 that's why uh, there are a lot of papers written on Rowhammer, because you can induce these bit flips in a repeatable manner through the software using a user-level program. You don't need to have any privileges into the system. You don't need to have any physical access to the system again, as I said earlier. Uh, and you can exploit the repeatable nature of bit flips. Okay, that's why the higher level implications are uh, not good from a security perspective. Okay, so this is an example of higher level implication. Basically, this is what we did in our original paper and we published the source code online. You can actually download it and test it on your computer, uh, see if it still works. It's been six years, uh, but Google actually improved our code to make it double-sided row hammer. So basically, what does this code do? This is x86 code. It's user level code. Uh, and basically what you do is you select address X and Y such that hopefully they map to the same bank. And then you try to cause repeated activates in an interlead manner to addresses X and Y, row addresses X and Y in this bank. That's the idea. They go to different rows to the same bank and you try to interleave uh, activates to this bank using the user level program, which means that uh, you need to bypass the caches in the CPU. You need to flush X and Y from the caches essentially. And it means that you need to bypass the cache in the DRAM, which is row buffer, essentially. You need to bypass that. And that's the idea, basically. You can do that by avoiding row bits to X and reading Y in another row. That's the idea over here. This way, you bypass the caches. As a result, what you do is this. This program hopefully works by doing consecutive activates, essentially forever. And if the chip is vulnerable, you will get bit flips. Now, what Google folks did is they selected X and Y such that they could sandwich one physical row in between them. As a result, they could amplify the number of bit flips you could get uh, in the system, uh, in the chip this way. And that's a very clever trick. Of course, we observed it. Unfortunately, we didn't really uh, characterize in our paper. If we had characterized, then we could have shown row hammer to be an even bigger problem than we had shown in our original paper. But it's fine. You cannot do everything in a single paper. Uh, so double-sided row hammer is really uh, the row hammer attack that's much uh, stronger today. There could be other patterns, of course, that could cause even more failures. Uh, uh, like we will talk about the trespass paper later on. Uh, maybe you, you actually need to hammer more around the vicinity over here. And maybe if you have X, Y, Z, you would get even more failures. But that remains to be studied even more rigorously. Okay. So uh, we, we ran this program on real systems, Intel and AMD systems. Clearly, these are x86 systems. And we saw that basically you get errors in real systems if the DIMMs are vulnerable. And errors correlate with the access rates that you can sustain to the main memory. Uh, and all memory controllers that I know of are actually uh, able to sustain uh, a, a large enough access rate to cause errors. And there are differences between the memory controllers for whatever reason. I'm not going to go into that. But as long as you can access memory fast enough, to do enough activates to cause these bit flips and vulnerable chips, you are going to cause errors. That's the idea. So this is a real reliability and security issue in the end. In my opinion, it's a more of a security issue. But clearly, it's a reliability problem that leads into a security issue. Uh, but uh, benign applications can actually see uh, get affected by this also potentially uh, because they may actually cause enough activates. Uh, now there are anecdotal evidence. There's anecdotal evidence that this happens in real systems. Uh, in some applications, it's not easy, it's not common, but it does happen actually uh, in some applications. And going forward, it may happen in more applications. But it's more of a security issue because someone actually can uh, uh, design a malicious application that can induce these bit flips to take over the system or cause some other problems. That's essentially what we said when we wrote the paper, actually. Basically, with this sort of uh, user level approach, one can take over an otherwise secure system. And uh, the idea uh, uh, actually is uh, this. Uh, so somebody is asking, how do you measure those error numbers? The exact methodology is actually in, in the paper. We basically look at the number of errors you can induce in a bank, for example. Uh, and we measured it using the FPGA-based infrastructure. Basically, the FPGA-based infrastructure, there's a test that the paper shows 
uh, that we, we run this test. Uh, well, not this one, actually. This one uh, is, is using this real uh, uh, code. But we also have other error numbers that were in the previous slides in the scaling numbers that was using a PGA-based infrastructure. This one, I believe, is measured in a single bank. But take a look at the paper for more detail. Uh, OK, uh, there's one more question. Let me see. Uh, when you say the bit flips are reproducible, does that mean hammering the same row at any later time will cause bit flips at exactly the same locations in the victim rows? Exactly. Yes, that's what I mean. Basically, exactly the same locations in the victim rows uh, are going to uh, be vulnerable, meaning they will flip if you hammer the same victim row. Uh, say, same uh, same uh, uh, hammered row, let's say. Aggressor row. We called it aggressor row. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, keep the questions coming. Uh, so, okay, uh, where was I? Basically, when we wrote the paper, the first sentence we said was, memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system, and access to one memory address should not have unintended side effects on data stored in other addresses. I strongly believe in this still. If you really want a reliable and secure computing system, you really want to provide isolation between memory locations, which means essentially this. Whenever you're accessing a memory location, you should not disturb other locations. I think this is very fundamental because if you do disturb, it doesn't matter whether it's a read access or write access. In, in, in this case, it's a read access actually. Uh, and activate is really a read in DRAM. If you look at it, you're really reading a row into the row buffer in DRAM. Uh, essentially, if this gets violated, then you have a security problem and also a reliability problem clearly. And we said that in the paper, we said that you could actually design a program that could crash the system that could also hijack the system uh, with more effort, of course. And while we were actually looking into it, these good folks from Google Project Zero uh, did the hard work and they actually published a blog post, which is beautiful, uh, saying that they were inspired from our work and they basically uh, provided a proof of concept attack that actually showed that you could take over the system. And you can see that they called it the DM Rohammer bug. I think that's their perspective is from a more software perspective. Uh, from their perspective, maybe it's a bug, but from a hardware fundamental perspective, I do not think this is a bug. It's a really a failure mechanism. Okay, basically uh, they said that, uh, so this is directly copy and paste from uh, their blog post, which I would recommend people to read if you really want to, our interest in security engineering. It's beautiful system security engineering. Uh, and this is the first work that started a large flurry of Rohammer type of attacks in the security community. Uh, they basically said they learned about the problem from our paper uh, and they basically reproduced the problem on a selection of laptops, which is good. It's always good if someone else, a completely independent of you without you knowing, validates and reproduces the problem. And they basically built two working privilege escalation exploits, essentially attacks that use this effect. One of them is not that interesting, I think, because it takes over the Google native client, essentially a virtual machine. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. It's not, not this attack, but some other older attack that's of a similar nature. Uh, but the other is very interesting, uh, which basically exploits these rohammer induced bit flips to gain kernel privileges on a Linux system when you actually use this as an unprivileged user process. Basically, you can launch an attack user, using this user level process and you gain kernel privileges, which clearly should not happen, right? It's, it's, a, it's a root, you gain root privileges. And uh, if you want to know exactly how this is done, you should really read the blog post because this is really uh, the beginning point of a lot of other attacks that take advantage of these Rohammer bit flips uh, to take over the system. I'll give you the basic insights. Uh, essentially, you're going to induce these bit flips in uh, operating system data structures, page table entries. You've learned about virtual memory in digital design and computer architecture, but in perhaps other courses also. If you don't know about virtual memory, I would recommend watching my virtual memory lectures from last semester. But basically, page table entries of a process indicate the permissions of what other pages in physical memory that you can uh, access, or virtual memory you can access, right? Uh, uh, essentially, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it provides protection and privilege information. Now, when you run this program, you can actually target it such that you can induce bit flip, uh, flips in your own page table entries. Basically, these are the page table entries of the program that point to the program's own page table, which determine the permissions of your own page table, right? And if you induce the right bits, let's assume that you can change the permission bits by flipping bits using Rohammer. 
And if you change the right permission bits, because you're smart, you've figured out which bits are vulnerable and magically in some way, you enable the system such that you can induce these bit flips in the permission bits. And life is not that easy as you will see if you read this blog post. Uh, you can actually get write enable access to your own page table. Basically you flip the right permission bits such, uh, that say, can I write to my own page table? And if you flip that bit, you can uh, initially that bit uh, says, no, you cannot. But if you flip it, it becomes, yes, you can. Now, if it becomes, yes, you can, the operating system trusts this table because you're not supposed to change in any other way. You don't have access privileges to change your page table. You don't have access privileges to write to your own page table. But in this case, you're breaking memory isolation. You're not writing to your own page, page table. You're just flipping a bit in your own page table by being smart about how you place the hammered row next to the victim rows. That's the idea. This way, without actually doing a real write operation on your, onto your page table, you're flipping a bit that you're not supposed to write into. Basically, you're breaking memory isolation. And once you can write to your own page table, you can get read and write access to all of your physical memory because you can change all of the mappings in your page table. Right? Now you can change all of the mappings as well as all of your permissions in your page table saying that, okay, I can do anything I want to any part of memory. And that's essentially how it works. Of course, what I said is not as easy to do in practice as it said. Uh, normally, uh, if you want, it's a probabilistic attack. You really want to actually uh, maximize the probability of flipping the right bits in your page table. And the paper, uh, this paper, and, and there's a Black Hat presentation by uh, Mike Seaborn actually that talks about how they've done this attack. And it's a beautiful attack. You can take a look at it. Now it's five years old, as you can see, right? There's a Black Hat 2015 presentation on it. Okay, so, and then actually uh, after this paper, the old hammer became even more uh, famous because clearly Google themselves showed that this is a big security vulnerability and uh, people started drawing pictures that looked like this. I kind of like this picture because it's really uh, getting uh, literal with low hammer, low hammer, if you will. And uh, some famous hackers uh, decided to comment on it. And I like this one uh, that where this person said, it's like breaking into an apartment by repeatedly slamming a neighbor's door until the vibrations open the door you were after. And I like this analogy because this is really, again, uh, electromagnetic interference, uh, maybe because things are too close. So for example, if you're stuck in your room right now, wherever you're watching me, and if you want to get out of the door and if you happen to find the door locked, no worries. If rope hammer is happening in your room, you should start banging on the wall. And if you do enough bangings on the wall frequently enough, hopefully your door will magically open. And that's the analogy. I'm not sure if that's going to happen in your door, but I can imagine some doors where this could potentially happen. Right? And maybe you can imagine also. But circuits are much more fragile. Uh, than doors and uh, uh, walls. So you may actually uh, 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 find out that you can, you can more easily do, do it in circuits. Okay, there's one other question. Should it that many access in a short time to the same location main memory be accessing a cache instead of actual DRAM? Yes, that's true, but uh, remember we want to bypass the cache. That's why we want to bypass the caches. If you want to induce these sort of attacks, you really want to bypass the caches such that uh, you're activating the year. So all of these attacks bypass the caches like I showed you in the, in the prior attack. And Google's attack also bypasses the caches. And bypassing the caches is really easy. Okay, so before Rohammer, uh, uh, so that's a very good question basically. If you want to cons uh, construct an attack, you should really bypass the caches. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, let me give you some historical perspective over here also. So people actually knew how to do attacks when you actually induce bit flips. Uh, in memory. I think this is a 2003 paper from IEEE Security and Privacy, which is one of the major conferences, security conferences. Uh, and this is a beautiful paper, I think. Uh, I had read it actually much earlier than we started working on Rollhammer. Uh, but basically, uh, what these folks do is they can take over uh, Java and .NET virtual machines. Uh, uh, basically, Java and .NET virtual machines have a, a protection structure. Normally, you should not uh, be able to take over uh, these machines uh, because they provide some protection. But what they actually show that if you induce bit flips in memory, 
uh, you can actually bypass uh, uh, all of the type checking that these machines rely on. And as a result, you can, you, can, you can basically control the virtual machine as a user in this case. So uh, the way this is done uh, is, uh, uh, in this case, they, they basically say we want physical memory errors. And they basically show that with these physical memory errors, uh, you can uh, attack the virtual machine. But basically, you can see that our attack works by sending to the JVM a Java program that is designed so that almost any memory error in its address space will allow it to take control of the JVM. All conventional Java and .NET virtual machines are vulnerable to this attack. Uh, and the technique is broadly applicable to other language-based security schemes of proof, such as proof carrying code. Okay, you don't need to know about all of this. But basically, they measure it on real commercial virtual machines. And with a probability of 70%, uh, they can actually uh, uh, execute arbitrary code within a Java virtual machine, which is not supposed to happen because these virtual machines are supposed to provide protection. And they also say our attack is particularly relevant against smart cards and tamper resistant computers where the user has physical access to the outside of the computer and can use various means to induce faults. We have successfully used heat, which is very interesting. I think these folks are actually, should be commended because they actually did a good job. Uh, they induced uh, failures, a bit clips using heat as I will show you in the next slide. Uh, and they were able to induce bit flips to take over the virtual machine. And basically, they basically said, you need to have physical access uh, to, be, to be able to do this. Uh, and this is the kind of physical access they required in their experimental infrastructure that you see over here. Uh, uh, so they actually, actually put a lamp somewhere over here. Uh, you can see over here, uh, uh, in, to induce memory errors, you have a PC, and then they have a clip-on gooseneck lamp. Uh, you can see it over here. I actually have such a lamp. Uh, and the 50 watt spotlight bulb and a digital thermometer. Uh, and they basically, using the heat coming out of the slam, they induce the memory errors. And sometimes they may induce a lot of memory errors, sometimes they may induce not a lot of memory errors, but essentially they showed that with this probabilistic attack, they can over take over the virtual machine, which is really interesting. And so people knew actually how to take over virtual machines, maybe not Linux uh, machines, uh, uh, maybe not at Linux kernel, with memory errors. But uh, interestingly, this work, which I believe is very, very interesting from a security perspective, really did not induce a lot of works uh, afterwards. Uh, I would expect, for example, there would be a lot of works showing that, oh, this is a big vulnerability, et cetera. This is not a big vulnerability because you need to have physical access. Now, what Rob Hammer did was enabled you to induce these bit flips in predictable locations and repeatable locations without having any physical access. So you could run a user level software program, no physical access to the machine, and you could induce these bit flips. And as a result, you could repeat what these folks did. And as a result, the security community became much more interested in the fundamental problem of Rob Hammer. So this also gives you uh, an idea in terms of how uh, security researchers also operate. Okay, this is a very interesting paper, but we cannot do anything with it because you need to have physical access. I cannot repeat it because it's a lot of work to really construct this infrastructure. And I'm not going to do it just to get some bit flips. Rohammer is published. Now, oh, I can induce bit flips in real computers through software without doing anything other than, of course, running user level software and constructing cool attacks that could induce those bit flips and then do more after that. Now the security folks are really interested because this is something they can really easily play with. And that's why Rob Hammer is a big security problem because it caused a huge shift of interest in the security community, uh, showing that all oh, these hardware problems are really, really interesting. I'm going to talk about a retrospective later on also, where we will see that Rob Hammer is actually one of the, uh, uh, perhaps the first hardware, big hardware problem that the security community actually latched onto in a big way and examined in a lot of detail. And then that led to a potential other hardware problems that the security community examined like Meltdown and Spectre, which came after Rohammer. Okay. Okay, so that's a, some historical perspective. And I would recommend reading this paper if you're interested because it's a beautiful paper also. But as I said, it's not an easy attack because you need to have physical access to the machine. Okay, let me give you some selected readings on Rohammer. In the meantime, I saw some discussion, uh, but I think it's resolved right now. People were asking how you could get rid of 
uh, uh, bypass the caches. Basically, you need to, to you need to uh, you, you want to check out uh, addresses X and Y from a row from the cache. How do you do that? Basically, you need to flush those addresses. And x86 has these CL flush commands, cache line flush commands that you could actually use at a user level. Uh, and that uh, enables you to easily kick out a line. And that made it easy for us. Now it turns out these cache line flush commands are privileged in some other ISAs. I believe in ARM they're privileged, so you cannot do it. Uh, that's fine. Uh, but basically, uh, people uh, figured out other ways of actually inducing these cache uh, flushes, getting rid of the uh, elements from a row from a cache by causing uh, interference from other, uh, 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 other processes or interference from within a process to map two, uh, two, two access things into the same cache block. And one of them gets kicked out because you cannot keep enough of these things map, uh, get mapped to the same cache block. Right? That's the idea by, by causing cache block interference. Okay, so I'm going to actually talk about some of these papers very briefly. Uh, okay, so uh, there's another question basically. I, I, I like the fact that people are uh, uh, thinking about uh, solutions, but we're going to talk about solutions, but maybe we get back to solutions uh, when we talk about solutions. So uh, let's think about the solutions when we get to it. One so can, can one solution be to add a small cache to the EM modules that can't be flushed from software? Potentially, yes, but you need to be very careful because uh, you need to ensure that that cache uh, cannot be uh, somehow bypassed because people are actually very, uh, 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 are able to do very interesting attacks right now. Uh, if that cache is very small, for example, if it has two entries or eight entries or 16 entries, maybe you circle, circle around and do enough activates that uh, trashes the cache. As a result, you may actually bypass your cache somehow. Again, this, uh, it's not clear if this can be done, uh, but uh, you need to be very careful in terms of the solutions that you provide. Uh, the solutions that are put inside the DM uh, by DM manufacturers try to do something similar. They don't necessarily cache things, uh, but uh, they try to keep uh, the number of activates somehow. They don't tell like, people exactly how, but that's our thinking of how it works. And we have essentially figured out how to bypass that solution because the data structure that they use to keep track of the number of activates for different rows is not large enough. So of course, you could build a huge cache potentially uh, that uh, no one can bypass. You need to prove that, I think, uh, so that you can perfectly secure. Uh, but the cost is also very high. Caching actually in DRAM is a very high cost because now you're adding SRAM uh, into your DRAM and that's a lot of cost. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, and I think there's another solution that says put crit crucial data to that DRAM region. I don't quite understand it, but let's get back to it. Uh, when, we, uh, when we talk about solutions. Okay, basically there's work, uh, as I said, Google Project Zero is the first security work that showed that this is a uh, vulnerability and they introduced also the double-sided row hammer. Uh, there's also this work uh, that basically showed that you can actually do row hammer without ham requiring uh, cache line flush instructions. And also you can do row hammer remotely by exploiting JavaScript that's, a, that's run in a, a server. So this is very interesting. And they basically said that uh, said, uh, we're able to do the CL flush free row hammer by inducing cache block uh, 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 interference in the cache such that the cache blocks that you want to be out of the cache get kicked out of the cache. Clearly this requires some reverse engineering of the cache, but people are very good at reverse engineering how things operate these days in hardware. So this also means that security by obscurity is not obscurity is not a good solution because people are good at reverse engineering. You cannot count on the fact that people are not going to be able to reverse engineer what you put in hardware. As, you, as we've also seen with Meltdown and Spectre, by the way. Okay, so this is also interesting because these folks have a fully automated attack that requires nothing but a website with JavaScript to trigger faults on remote hardware. And they claim that they can gain unrestricted access to what systems of website visitors. So this is what happens when you get a bit flip that's exposed to the software at the higher levels. And this also is another paper that also proposed some prediction protection, a software-based protection mechanism. I don't believe the software-based protection mechanisms are easy to make work easily, uh, but you can take a look at this paper. Uh, but this also introduced a, a cache line flush free row hammer in a similar way that this paper did, around, uh, maybe around the same time, I'm not sure. 
Okay, so there are other works that I'm not going to go into detail, but you can see the interesting attacks. For example, it's the first reliable remote exploit for the ROM hardware vulnerability running entirely in Microsoft Edge. You can reliably own a system with all defense stuff, even if the software is entirely free of bugs by uh, exploiting memory duplication, for example. You can take a look at it. And then uh, this one uh, also uh, has some uh, software only mitigation. For example, it says uh, we should really partition physical memory into user versus kernel and limit draw hammer induced bit flips to the user domain. Now this could get rid of some attacks perhaps. Uh, I'm not sure if get rid of all of the attacks. Uh, I think this partitioning sort of approaches uh, maybe mitigates in the short term some of the attacks, but maybe in the long term you're still vulnerable because fundamentally you have not really fixed the problem, right? This basically can enable, uh, ensure that user kernel boundary is not crossed perhaps, but is it really not crossed within the user, between users? Now you still have the problem between the users and between different kernel code also, right? So you gotta be very careful, I think. But I think this is a potential solution, a software solution. And uh, there are other uh, clear attacks that I'm not gonna bore you with, but uh, it's, 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 it's really fun and interesting to see some of these works. Like this, this is another technique that allows a malicious guest virtual machine to have read and write access to arbitrary physical pages on a shared machine. Okay, and these folks are actually very creative they actually came up with a graph-based algorithm to reverse engineer mapping of physical address in DRAM. So to be able to launch these rope hammer attacks in a good way, you need to know uh, which address that you have uh, and in the higher levels of the software stack, uh, where do those addresses get mapped in physical rows in DRAM? And this is not obvious actually, because what happens is internally, uh, there's some row remapping that happens in DRAM because there are some faults that happen in DM and internally DM manufacturers take address X and they may map it to address X plus, I don't know, 50, for example. Uh, they may do it for all addresses or they may do it in special cases where if they actually use address X directly for physical row X, that's not a good idea because physical row X is known, known faulty. They figure this out after manufacturing. So they can remap address X to address X plus 50, let's say. I just made it up. Uh, and uh, that clearly makes it difficult to hammer uh, parts that are physically adjacent to each other because the address that you think is going to be physically adjacent may not be physically adjacent, right? So if you reverse engineer these addresses somehow, then you can actually uh, do these attacks much more efficiently. So a lot of the work in the security community went into reverse engineering uh, these DRM addresses. And, it's not perfect. Some of the things maybe you cannot reverse engineer completely, but people actually uh, made a lot of progress on reverse engineering just enough to be able to actually launch these attacks in a reliable fashion. Okay, so there are more, again, uh, I guess uh, if I go through all of these, it's going to be a lot, uh, but let's keep going, I think. Uh, you can read these papers if you're interested. Uh, I'm gonna talk about this paper as a, uh, as a picture, essentially, this paper is very interesting because it, can, it shows that you, you can take over an ARM-based system deterministically uh, and expose predictable physical memory allocator behavior as we will discuss in a little bit. Uh, okay, and I'll keep going, I think. Uh, I, I basically, you can take a look at it uh, on your own if you're interested. Uh, there's a lot more work than actually what's really shown over here. Basically, this, this is actually uh, interesting. Also, I have some picture later on. Again, this is on mobile platforms and that uses GPU. It's a GPU based attack. It basically induces these bit flips to the WebGL interface. And essentially with a GPU, you can hammer DRAM a lot faster because you have a lot more parallelism with a GPU. And as a result, they showed that you can compromise mobile devices much faster than shown before. Uh, and then this fault, these folks actually showed that you could trigger an exploit row hammer in a remote machine by sending network packets essentially through the remote direct memory access interface, which allows you to read the memory, physical memory of a remote machine. And you could actually do a hammer through sending remote packets, which is really interesting, right? And these old folks actually showed exactly the same thing. So uh, it's, it's not like one, uh, these, these attacks are actually repeated multiple times over the history of uh, the last six years, let's say. And this is a solution basically, and you can take a look at it. I, I, I actually, 
uh, stopped, I think, adding to this list in October 2018. There's more clearly, and I'll refer you to some papers. But basically, uh, clearly this is a security problem, and there are many attacks to show, demonstrate that security problem. Uh, but the first folks who were really interested in our work uh, that picked up on our work were actually reliability folks, people who did memory testing. So these are, this is actually Memtest x86 uh, done by Passmark Software. This is one of the major software that's used in testing memory. Uh, for example, this software runs uh, whenever your memory boots up. Uh, uh, I mean, whenever maybe is a strong word, but uh, your memory boots up and it does a memory test. Uh, it can run under conditions where, peop uh, where the operating system may think that there's a problem with memory. It can be initiated by you, okay? Uh, this sort of memory tests are done by uh, people who manufacture modules uh, or people who actually buy modules. For example, if you're a large company uh, like Microsoft, Amazon, or Google, uh, whenever you buy uh, a large batch of modules, which you actually do, or Apple, let's say, uh, or some other company that actually puts DRAM uh, into systems uh, uh, that, is, that are going to, uh, that are mass manufactured uh, in data centers, in mobile devices, etc. cetera, uh, uh, then you, it may, it, it's, it's probably a wise idea to actually test the memory batches that you get before you deploy them on, their system, on your systems. And this testing can be done using commercial software like this, or you could build your own software clearly, or you could build an FPGA-based infrastructure like we have done, right? There's nothing that prevents these large companies to actually build exactly what we have built. They have even more resources than us. Now, as far as I know, not many people have this FPGA-based infrastructure, which is really interesting. They rely on these higher level software tests uh, to actually uh, do these things. Uh, and as a result, uh, these, uh, uh, the, the vendor of these software tests, one of the major software tests, Passmark Software, they basically read our paper, uh, one of the first people I think to act on our paper, let's say, in 2014. They basically designed a hammer test, which I don't believe cover, covers everything, but it's a good start. Uh, but basically they designed this hammer test uh, uh, to test for row hammer. And uh, they actually explain why they designed it, as you can see over here. Uh, and they basically, after they designed this hammer test, they got a lot of calls from people saying that, oh, we're, a lot of our modules are fail failing. To me, this is another validation of our work showing that, oh, okay, a lot of people are actually seeing these errors. So they had to add this to their web page, saying that the errors detected during test 13, which is the raw hammer test, albeit exposed only in extreme memory access cases, are most certainly real errors. <laughs> so they basically had to tell people that these are real errors. It's not a bug in our program. You're really experiencing real errors if you actually are getting errors in these tests, which means that you're DRAM chip is vulnerable to roll hammer, which is interesting. Right? So this is another anecdote that you may find interesting. And I find it educational because you know, for, for this sort of thing, I think the first people to pick up on it are testing people. And I think that makes sense. But that said, I think testing for roll hammer is not an easy problem. So these folks, they have some test that's running in their program. I believe it's proprietary. I'm not sure at this point. I don't know if they open sourced it or if they share it with people who buy their tests. I don't know. Uh, but having a software test that perfectly finds all Rohammer failures is a difficult problem. First of all, uh, you need to actually do, the, ex do uh, the right things to induce these failures. That's the first step. Uh, second, you need to do it in a reasonable amount of time. Basically, you cannot take, I guess, 10 days whenever you boot up, booting up a machine to declare that you don't get errors, right? You need to do it in a reasonable amount of time. And both of these are hard. First of all, doing the right things to actually cause Rohammer bit flips. Okay, the programs that I showed you are relatively easy. Uh, and at the time, it was easy to write. But at the software level, uh, you may not be inducing all of the failures. You may not be basically doing a double-sided Rohammer, for example. And double-sided row hammer is important, I think, compared to single-sided, because that really reduces the number of activates you have to do to induce these failures significantly. Let's say 2x, OK? Uh, and doing the double-sided row hammer may not be easy if you don't know the uh, exact physical addresses 
of your DRAM rows, which rows are adjacent to each other, right? At the software level, you don't necessarily know that. You need to reverse engineer it. And that's why this has been the subject of research. And I don't believe Passmark Software did a perfect reverse engineering as early as 2014. A lot of the papers on reverse engineering were published in 2016 or so, for example. OK, so uh, this gives you an example of how, why testing is difficult, actually, why testing for Rohammer is difficult. Ideally, we would like to do this, actually. Whenever we actually have uh, a new memory plugged into our computer, we would like to declare it Rohammer free. Now, is it easy? No, it's not easy. And also, there are other issues that uh, are interesting to examine, like aging issues, like temperature issues. And I think these are some things that uh, we may brainstorm about because there are actually resource directions also. Okay. So basically, this gives you a, another historical perspective. These folks also talked about potential solutions that are proposed. We'll get back to this, basically. DM manufacturers uh, put up this targeted row refresh or target row refresh solution, uh, which essentially is an obscure solution. There's some uh, description in the standard, uh, but it's not clear how it's implemented. Uh, and uh, yeah, we will see actually if it actually works in the future. But we basically recently showed that even DRAM chips that claim to be row hammer free because they implement this target row refresh solution are actually not row hammer free because you could actually bypass whatever solution this is internally and actually cause bit flips in DRAM chips that are advertised to be completely row hammer free. Okay, we will get back to this uh, when we talk about row hammer in 2020. Okay. So this is uh, an example of, uh, okay, when we actually wrote the first paper or no hammer, we basically said there are multiple security implications. You breach memory protection. So you could actually do a disturbance attack. You can corrupt pages belonging to another program and actually hijack another uh, system. And we didn't do the full attack and later security folks did the full attack clearly. And this is some pictorial example of some of the attacks. Uh, I've already discussed this basically. You could do it remotely through a JavaScript and these folks actually showed that you could, they could gain NRC access to systems of website visitors by executing JavaScript code. Uh, these folks actually, I'll spend some time on it. Basically, uh, some, somehow the security community didn't think that you could induce these attacks on ARM processors. I don't know why, uh, but sometimes security community and software community uh, may not be up to date on how memory controllers are designed clearly. But this paper showed that you could actually do this on Android systems, on cell phones, uh, on ARM processors. Uh, from my perspective, any processor that can do enough activates to induce bit flips in a vulnerable chip, can, uh, you can do these attacks on. And I think that's true for any chip that is out there today, actually, uh, because these chips have memory controls that are powerful enough. Uh, and these folks actually did something even more than showing that you could do this on ARM chips. But they basically showed that you could gain control of a smartphone deterministically. In fact, they had an app. Uh, to do that, you can Jammer app, I think, uh, and you can actually download this app, maybe if it's, it's, if it's still functional and rent on your Android phone and see if you get compromised, I'm curious. Uh, but basically this app, what it did was, it's carefully figured out which parts, which rows in your physical memory uh, are most vulnerable to bit flips. And then it's fooled the operating system to allocate a page table belonging to this app a page table entry belongs to this app to those most vulnerable locations. And then it's hammered those locations by uh, hammering a row next to them. That's the idea. So now how, they, how were they able to do this in a deterministic way? How were they able to fool the operating system and kind of guide it to allocate a page table entry of theirs to a location that they knew is vulnerable to row hammer? Well, because the operating system actually had a predictable algorithm that they clearly knew how it behaved to allocate physical memory to uh, different processes. They basically were able to fool this predictable algorithm such that they could place the page that they wanted to hammer into uh, the location that was most vulnerable to row hammer. So that's the high level, of course. How do you do it? It's a lot of nitty gritty of security engineering. But it's doable, basically. And this paper shows how, how, how it's doable. And I'd recommend reading it if you're interested in a, another beautiful security engineering uh, uh, attack. OK, so I already talked about you can do it in GPUs, accelerated. Uh, 
You can do it through the remote direct memory access engine. Uh, and other folks also show that you can do it on remote servers through the remote direct memory access engine. Remote direct memory access is actually very interesting. It's used for programming distributed systems in data centers, for example. Uh, that way, uh, you can uh, enable two servers to communicate, for example. One server can write to a location in the physical memory of another server to, during this remote, remote store, for example. You can also do remote load. You, you, can, you can load from the memory location of another physical server. Right? Of course, you need to set up things correctly to be able to do that, but you could do remote memory access this way, which is nice. And it's very useful in distributed systems programming in data centers, for example, in high performance computing, et cetera. It's a nice protocol. Unfortunately, it's also vulnerable to Rollhammer because you could, you could do enough remote memory accesses to activate a physical memory location in a remote server enough so that you can induce bit flips. And that's the idea over here. And there's some recent paper that shows that you could actually leak information using Rollhammer, even if you're not able to take over the system, et cetera. Uh, and this is also interesting. And there are some potential Rollhammer type of attacks in flash memory, which we may talk about when we discuss uh, flash memory. But basically, uh, there are many security implications. And this could be another security implication if you actually have all kinds of Rollhammer problems and you don't know what else to do, right? Of course, it's a joke. Maybe this is a solution to your problem, right? Hammering your computer so that nobody else can hammer it in a software fashion. Okay, but that's a joke, of course. So uh, we're going to talk about solutions, but let's talk about understanding Rollhammer first. So what are the causes of this? I'm not going to go into detail. You can read some papers, especially from our retrospective paper. We point people to many potential causes. And these are confirmed by at least two manufacturers right now. That's an old slide. Uh, manufacturers don't like talking about it, actually. It's unfortunate, actually. When we first approached them, they didn't want to have anything to do with it in 2014, actually early as, as early as 2012. Uh, uh, some of them were willing to actually discuss the causes, uh, which was nice, but uh, unfortunately they uh, took a, a route of security by obscurity. We're not going to talk about it, uh, which is not very good from a, a computing system building perspective, right? DRM is everywhere. And if, uh, if one part of the component is faulty and people are not willing to cooperate to actually really make it not faulty, then that's not good because all of our computers actually rely on it. This is actually a very sad case in my opinion. And it's very sad that the solution is not uh, foolproof at this point. Uh, I think it's because the industry is divided into these factions and some factions are making enough money to ignore some of the problems, let's say. Okay, but basically there are real physical causes. One is uh, electromagnetic coupling. Uh, as I said, toggling the word line voltage briefly increase the voltage in adjacent word lines and it leads to charge leakage by slightly opening adjacent rows. And there's truth to this for sure, but it's not the full truth. Uh, basically, uh, this is part of the effect. Uh, clearly not all cells are vulnerable, so there's more going on, meaning internally a cell needs to have vulnerability to this electromagnetic coupling. And what is that vulnerability is actually discussed in some papers and we referenced them. I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but conductive bridges may get formed across cells. And that leads to leakage also. And some cells actually potentially get uh, permanently uh, damaged because some hot carriers can get injected into them because of these large number of activates. This is, happens very uh, less often and maybe not as permanently as hot carrier injection actually uh, indicates, but some similar effects may happen over here. Okay, so there are actually multiple sophisticated causes that are really difficult to model. Uh, there are papers out there and I'd recommend you take a look at these uh, device level papers if you're interested. So we did a lot of testing to understand Rowhammer uh, using our infrastructure. And this was really the infrastructure that we did use. So you can see that we did a lot of testing in parallel. Uh, and we, uh, in total, we tested 129 DRAM modules from three major manufacturers, as you can see. I'm gonna give you some basic characterization results uh, that are really interesting in my opinion. Uh, and then uh, we're gonna talk about some solution directions. And then we're gonna talk about Rowhammer in 2020. So basically, uh, let's talk about the, uh, number four over here. So let's talk about adjacency aggress aggressor versus victim. And this is row address difference from the perspective of the memory controller. In this case, we didn't really reverse engineer row addresses uh, in the DRAM. So we're gonna look at the address difference between the victim and the aggressor rows in the, let's say, from the memory controller's perspective. So there might be internal remapping going on of these row addresses I discussed for fault tolerance reasons. Uh, but if you look at this row address difference for worst chips 
worst meaning, vulnerable in the worst manner uh, from each of these manufacturers um, in the most errors, basically. This is what we get. Basically, uh, uh, the aggressor and the victim are mostly adjacent, in most of the times adjacent to each other in, the, in terms of the row addresses that are uh, known to the memory controller. Let's say, let's call them memory controller row addresses or logical row addresses. So this uh, likely implies physical adjacency also, but not necessarily, but probably yes, because of what we are seeing. That's true for uh, this manufacturer, right? But some other manufacturer, this B over here, even though most of the addresses are logically adjacent, there are some addresses that are not logically adjacent, as you can see over here, right? So you can see that they're not adjacent. So the question is, what is going on over here? Uh, there are multiple reasons. One is they may be remapping the row addresses. Clear that's possible. Uh, or uh, multiple different rows uh, can be actually affected by a single row hammer. And that is actually also true, according to our results. So I believe both of them are actually true. And uh, the, the paper actually talks about both of them. Okay, so let's take a look at access interval. This is how frequently you're doing the activates uh, to the aggressor row. Uh, these are the results based on our FPGA infrastructure, by the way. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, minimum, uh, lower than 55 nanoseconds is not allowed. 55 nanoseconds is the TRC uh, row cycling delay. Basically, you cannot, you're not allowed to do uh, more frequent activates than every 55 nanoseconds to a row. That's defined by the standard. Otherwise, you're violating the standard and getting bit flips is probably expected. Okay, so without violating the standard, uh, this is what, you, what we got, basically. If you increase the access interval, clearly you're getting less bit flips. Why? Because you're reducing the number of activates you can do within a refresh interval, right? That's the idea. But if you really want to actually get rid of all of the bit flips, you really need to act, increase the access interval a lot, which is not good. So this is not a good solution probably. Uh, across the board, increasing the access interval is not good because you need to increase it to such values that are unreasonable. Otherwise you won't be able to do two consecutive activates for a really long time basically. But this is as expected as you can see, right? It's a nice curve over here. Okay, so less frequent accesses lead to fewer errors as expected and we verify it over here. Okay, refresh interval is another interesting thing because it could be part of the solution, right? So part, this could be part of the solution also, basically. You say, okay, I disallow accesses, uh, and you can only do activate activates to a row after 500 nanoseconds. No, it doesn't sound good. Okay, this is the, uh, yeah. That, that, uh, that, that basically reduces your performance. Okay, so refresh interval, clearly, if you reduce the refresh interval, which means you more frequently refresh, hopefully you're gonna see fewer errors because you cannot do enough activates to see the bit flips. But if you increase your refresh interval, which, we, which is really what we want to do in general, right? We want to get rid of refresh as much as possible. Probably you're gonna see more bit flips because you're gonna be able to do more activates, which is going to cause more bit flips. So a refresh and row hammer, unfortunately are opposed to each other. Eliminating refresh leads to row, more row hammer faults uh, and if you want to fix row hammer, maybe you want to increase your refresh rate. Now we're going to talk about that as a potential solution. But this is what the curves look like. Here, the errors become zero, as you can see. So if you really want to get rid of all of the errors in the worst possible DRAM chip that you've examined, which doesn't mean that that's the worst possible DRAM chip that you can ever buy. So keep in mind that one. This is the worst possible DRAM chip that we examined among 129 DRAM modules, which is not a lot. There are millions, maybe billions of DRAM modules around, right? Uh, even then, you, you need to increase your refresh interval by 7x to get rid of all of the errors. This doesn't sound good again, right? More frequent refreshes lead to fewer errors because you can now cause fewer activates. But to get rid of all of the errors, you need to increase your refresh interval by 7x. Again, that doesn't sound good because you remember from the earlier lecture, we want to actually get rid of refreshes to actually make DRAM a better memory. Now we have two problems with the app. Both of them are scaling problems, refresh and rope hammer. And one goes against each other. Uh, one goes against the other, right? So solve rope hammer, you can increase refreshes, but now you're exacerbating the refresh problem, right? So it's very problematic basically. 
Now, uh, let's talk about data pattern. This is also important. We talked about this in refresh, also retention time. Basically, there's a data pattern dependence. You can see that this data pattern doesn't cause as many errors as this data pattern. Why? There's a lot more coupling that happens in the row strike pat pattern. In this case, adjacent rows are uh, ones and zeros respectively in an alternating manner. Why does this cause more coupling? Because the rows of one, uh, the cells of one row are charged, the cells of the other row are discharged. As a result, you get high voltage differential between those coupling cells and you get high coupling capacitance. And as a result, the probability of inducing errors increases this way. So this is also very data pattern dependent because of coupling capacitance and row hammers fundamentally related to coupling as we have discussed. So if you really want to attack a system, you really want to fix your data patterns also. That's what makes things a little bit more difficult to attack as well. So these solid patterns, even though you can induce row hammer bit flips, they're much fewer than what you could induce if you maximize your coupling across the different rows. Very interesting. Other works actually have shown this as well. So basically errors are affected by data stored in other cells. And that's important, similar to refresh. From, from this perspective, it's similar to retention time, but that's it. The, uh, basically, uh, coupling is the common case over here. But we also found that victim cells for row hammer or, or row hammer vulnerable cells are not the same as leaky or retention vulnerable cells or low retention cells. There's almost no overlap between them. The reason is these are two different failure mechanisms. Retention leakage happens through leakage through the access transistor. Row hammer happens because of coupling issues and problems that you have inside uh, these disturbance, uh, to, to disturbance effects. And these tend to be two different failure mechanisms. Okay, uh, this is one thing that uh, we're actually currently working on, understanding temperature even better. We found out the areas are not strongly affected by temperature. But there is some effect, as you can see. Uh, that's that's one, of the, and one of the other things that actually uh, gives you an idea that, OK, maybe this is not really related to retention as much. Right? Because uh, victims, uh, weak cells, in terms of retention, they're very much affected by temperature. If you remember the retention lecture, we talked about a nice curve. It's not here, but it's in one of the papers that I mentioned in our ISCA 2013 paper. Nice curve that shows that uh, uh, the, uh, the refresh, required refresh interval increases, uh, I guess by, uh, I guess 10x for every 10 degrees increase in temperature. I don't remember 10x, or doubles, sorry, doubles, not, the, not, not 10x. It doubles by every 10 degrees increase in temperature. And that's not, clearly not the case with row hammer errors. And I already said this, errors are repeatable. Basically, victim cells uh, uh, have errors in every iteration of testing and uh, uh, across 10 iterations, and there are enough victim cells that you can take advantage of. Okay, so let's talk about uh, how many errors you get per cache line uh, whenever you do this. You get as many as four errors, which means that simple error correcting codes cannot prevent all errors. So somebody may think that error correcting code is a good solution. I actually don't think this is a good solution. Uh, this is one of the reasons, basically why, because uh, you get actually more errors than can be protected and corrected by simple ECC, which is what we have today. Single error correcting, double error detecting ECC. If you get four errors, this ECC cannot help you, unfortunately. And we get more than four, uh, as many as four errors per cache line. There's another reason why ECC is not a good solution. And the reason is, it's a very heavy handed solution. Meaning, uh, to, to have error correcting codes, you need to add it to every single cache block, right? You need to add a storage overhead, essentially. And that storage overhead may be justified if you cannot correct these errors in some other way in a simple manner. Uh, and that's, uh, I think that's not true for row hammer. You can correct these errors in a simple way in some other manner, as we will discuss. But uh, if you want, if you, if you have errors that are kind of random and you have no idea what the cause is, or you have no idea how to actually correct it, in some other way, then ECC is a good solution. And uh, this is a good solution for random errors, for example, variable retention time errors. These are random errors. And we do not have a good idea of how to actually correct these variable retention time cause failures. Having a simple ECC is probably not a bad idea. And paying the cost of that is probably not an idea because you don't know where the errors will occur. That's true for soft error induced errors also. So it's particle hits 
uh, your DM chip and a bit flips. These are random processes. Again, it's very hard to predict where these errors will happen. And as a result, simple ECC may be a good idea. Okay, for Rohammer, I do not think it's a good idea. Uh, and in fact, it's very interesting. Uh, I will give an anecdote over here, even though we're a bit uh, longer than what we're supposed to be. Uh, but let me give you the anecdote anyway. Uh, when I presented Rohammer in a supercomputing conference in 2015, uh, I basically talked about Rohammer. And the next, folk, uh, next person who presented uh, was going to, uh, I didn't talk about Rohammer a lot. I did talk about multiple things actually in memory, including in memory computation. Uh, next person who presented was from Micron. And he was actually a very senior architect at Micron. Uh, and basically, uh, he started his talk uh, rebutting what I said, saying, I have a solution. We have a solution to, e uh, so to Rohammer. And it's ECC. <laughs> And uh, I mean, I didn't really, uh, we, we discussed it with them later on, but uh, basically that's a terrible solution, I think. And I think industry has already figured out that it's a terrible solution. It's a bit sad that they have advocated the solution for some time. Uh, they should have known better in a sense. Uh, ECC is really not a good solution. And in fact, there's a later paper that showed clearly that even if you have rank level ECC in the memory controller, you could bypass that ECC by reverse engineering. And uh, uh, actually, cause Rohammer bit flips much more frequently. Okay, so ECC is not a good solution. Unless you go with a very strong ECC, then it's, it's not a good solution from power and performance perspective. Maybe you have a very strong ECC that can correct, let's say, 10 errors per cache line. That's a lot of overhead in terms of hardware. Yes, you get rid of Rohammer errors, perhaps, let's say, but at what cost? That's a lot of cost, complexity, uh, energy, and latency in terms of correcting the errors also. So ECC, I think, is in general is a bad idea for errors whose causes you know reasonably well. Okay, so this is interesting. Uh, basically, this is the number of cells and rows affected by the aggressor. We have one aggressor. It turns out it affects actually more than one row, more than two rows, actually. It should affect two ad adjacent rows, clearly. But we found out that it affects nine adjacent rows, some of them, uh, which means that there is a Rohammer effect in not immediately physically adjacent rows. There's a smaller Rohammer effect clearly in the next adjacent and then the next adjacent and the next adjacent. Okay? And the number of victim cells also uh, large as you can see. So this is actually interesting because this is becoming worse as we will see in the 2020 works. Okay. And cells are affected by two aggressors on either side. We actually talked about that when we talked about uh, our first paper. And Google exploited that as, as we discussed, basically. Uh, basically, uh, uh, you, you, can be, uh, you can have problems from both of your aggressors. OK, this is the first row of hammer analysis. And this is one of the papers that you could choose to read for your homework. I would recommend reading all of them anyway uh, so that you get a good idea. But let's talk about solutions. I mean, we've kind of been uh, talking about solutions, thanks to some of the questions also. And feel free to ask more questions also uh, at this point if you're interested. But I, there are two types of solutions. Uh, one is immediate. You have this vulnerability in the field. What do you do? Right? There are vulnerable DRAM chips in the field. Uh, how can we fix the problem for those vulnerable DRAM chips such that we're not, uh, we don't have the security problem? And clearly, there are limited possibilities in this because our memory controllers were not designed to anticipate such things. Uh, uh, and our memory was clearly not designed to anticipate such things. That's one thing. And we're going to discuss some immediate solutions. Uh, and the longer term solutions can be even better, hopefully, uh, to protect future DM chips. And here you can have a wider range of protection mechanisms. And we're going to talk briefly about that also. So our ISCA 2014 paper proposed both types of solutions, and there are seven solutions in total. And we proposed PARA as the best solution. And variants of this, maybe not the perfect variants, are already employed in the field as part of the PTRR mechanism that Intel has deployed. And maybe internally, some of the DM, actually earlier DMs employed it as well. Uh, but maybe they don't do a perfectly great job in employing it. But let's talk about some potential solutions. Uh, basically, making better DRAM chips is a good, maybe, for example, increasing the electrical isolation between the rows. Maybe it's a possibility, but it's not possible today because that increases the cost significantly. So basically, it's not easy. Using new materials, for example, to isolate different rows, these are all things that you can imagine, but all of them are very costly. All of them reduce density significantly. Refreshing frequently is something we're going to discuss. Refreshing all across the board, increasing the refresh rate basically from, let's say, 64 milliseconds to 
32 milliseconds or 16 milliseconds. Now that's an immediate solution you can deploy because you can program your memory controller when you, before you boot up, change the BIOS settings such that this is what happens. And this is easy to do clearly, but is this what, something what we really want to do? But it may be the only thing that we can do today immediately in the absence of other solutions, or at, at least five, six years ago when we published our paper, that was the only thing to do, right? And I think this is not a bad, in the end, uh, solution, to, uh, immediate solution to the problem in the absence of anything else. Now, that's not a great endorsement, as you can see, right? Because I, we don't like refresh and nobody likes refresh, but this is what had to be done. So sophisticated CC, we already talked about this, uh, cost and power is a problem. And the last one over here is keeping track of accesses to rows and potentially throttling accesses to rows that are misbehaving. Meaning uh, throttling accesses to rows that can potentially cause row hammer. Now, this is a potentially interesting solution if you do it well. And the downside of course is keeping track of accesses. This, this is cost, power, complexity. In our original paper, we dismissed the solution. And I still think it's not an easy solution, but you need to do, you need to be very clever to be able to reduce the cost, power, and complexity. Okay, so naive solutions we already discussed, throttle X the same row, not a good idea. Refresh more frequently, not a good idea uh, because they increase uh, uh, your overheads in terms of performance and power. But let's talk about the solution that's employed immediately. And I'm gonna uh, cite the security release from Apple because this is nice, uh, because they talk about row hammer, they acknowledge the problem, and they say this leads to memory corruption, and they say we mitigate the issues by uh, essentially increasing the memory refresh rates. They don't tell how much they increase the memory refresh rates. I don't believe it's 4x, I think it's 2x or so. Not terrible, but I don't think it's, it, it basically mitigates the vulnerability, but doesn't get rid of the vulnerability. And these folks were nice enough because they actually uh, referenced our original research uh, in their uh, security release, as you can see over here. Not everybody is nice enough, unfortunately, in industry. Uh, they, they, they take and use the research that's produced, uh, which is good, I think. They should, I think. Uh, unfortunately, they need to act, uh, do the uh, due diligence to acknowledge what they use also. Some folks do, some folks don't. And I think it's nice that these folks did. Okay. So a lot of other folks released similar patches, uh, and you can guess that some of them did not really acknowledge what happened in research. They just magically found out this row hammer problem, right? Okay, so let's talk about our solution to row hammer before we uh, conclude this lecture. And uh, I'll find a good point to actually finish so that we can start uh, uh, next lecture with uh, the next steps in row hammer. But basically our solution is very simple. It's probabilistic adjacent row activation, and it's probabilistic uh, after closing a row, the memory controller activates one or both of its neighbor, uh, neighbors of the row, physically adjacent neighbors, with a very low probability. That's the idea. And if you set the probability right, hopefully you will ensure that you cannot do enough activates to actually cause disturbance to any row. That's the idea. So, and we showed in the paper that with the numbers that we have seen in terms of row hammer causing number of activates, you can get a very good reliability guarantee that's much better than hard disks. Basically your error rate is acceptable enough, let's say. And if you're paranoid or if for some reason, uh, the number of activates that you needed to, to do to induce row hammer reduces over time, you can adjust the value of P. So it's programmable. So you can vary the strength of protection against theirs. I like the solution. The downside is there are multiple downsides. One is probabilistic, it's not deterministic. Uh, with probabilistic, there's always this unsureness that somebody can potentially uh, uh, bypass this and still cause failures. I don't believe that's true actually if you adjust P appropriately. Uh, and this, uh, this solution can also be extended to uh, multiple rows being affected by an adjacent row, right? So you can actually refresh not just one of the neighbors, but multiple of the neighbors. Let's say two neighbors up and two neighbors down, right? That way you can actually get rid of potential uh, effects on non-immediately adjacent neighboring rows. Okay, so uh, these are, uh, you can actually extend this mechanism nicely, I think. Of course, the key is adjusting the value of P, figuring out how many rows you need to refresh uh, uh, that are immediately and not immediately adjacent. Okay, so uh, 
uh, th there's advantages. The advantage is low power, low performance overhead, uh, and uh, average slowdown is very low, as we discussed. Uh, you can read the paper for it. Maximum slowdown that we get is also very low. So the performance impact is very low, and it's also stateless. You don't need to keep track of which drops are being activated. Uh, you don't need to increase the refresh rate clearly or across the board. So it's low cost and low complexity. You do need a random number generator, uh, as we propose in the paper, but I frankly don't believe that you need that also. And there may be other ways of actually getting uh, this random number generator, frankly. Uh, as we will discuss in a later lecture, we found out that you can actually uh, use random number, uh, some, some bits in DM as random number generators. So, okay. The, the jury is still out whether pair is a perfect solution. And if people are interested, maybe you can, you can see if you can actually extend para to be a really robust solution. And I'd be interested in people thinking about this direction if, if there, are, uh, there are people who are interested in doing potential uh, projects at some point. Not in this course, of course, but uh, related to some other things like research. And this is very much needed today because industry doesn't have a good solution. Apparently the solution that they proposed uh, as being rope hammer free, which they don't disclose exactly how it operates, is not rope hammer free. Okay, so it's, it's very important to look into solutions. And I believe Paris solution is still a good solution, but it needs to be proven fully correct, let's say. Okay, so there are requirements for para. Unfortunately, uh, it can, well, fortunately, it can be implemented in the DRAM chip or the memory controller. If it's implemented in the DRAM chip, it's nice uh, because the DRAM chip, in the DRAM chip, the DRAM manufacturer knows which rows are physically adjacent, right? Now you can actually refresh the physically adjacent rows. And you can actually uh, take advantage of the slack and timing parameters to these refreshes. Basically, there's plenty of slack today. We're gonna cover some of these papers that show that whenever you're doing refresh, you're waiting for too long. Whenever you're doing an access, you're waiting for too long because of worst case design. The, uh, the, the timing is dictated by worst case conditions today, which means that, okay, you're waiting for too long, that's not good. Uh, maybe one solution, one way, uh, one, one thing to take advantage of it, uh, while you're waiting for too long is to sneak in refreshes uh, to adjacent rows in DRAM that are dictated by uh, probabilistic adjacent row activation. And that's not a bad idea, I think, assuming you keep the slack and assuming you do this reliably. And I believe this can potentially be done if you're doing very, being very careful, uh, especially in the refresh cycle. For example, today, Whenever you issue a refresh, you need to wait for too long. The refreshes are internally done earlier. So you could actually sneak in more refreshes in the DRAM chip, if you know what you're doing, to adjacent rows. That's the idea, basically, exploit the slack. I don't think this is a good long-term solution, uh, unless you actually design the DRAM extremely carefully. I think a good long-term solution is really having better coordination between memory control and DRAM such that, or implementing the memory control inside the DRAM, like in 3D stack technologies, as we will discuss later, uh, and having this better coordination such that memory controller uh, issues these things whenever it's needed. In this case, of course, the memory controller needs to know which DRM rows are physically adjacent. So there needs to be some communication or reverse engineering. It can be mostly reverse engineered, but it's not clear if it's, it can be fully reverse engineered. Okay, that said, there are things that look like probabilistic activation in real life that are implemented in real Intel memory controllers. And for example, this is the BIOS of an Intel memory controller. And Intel, uh, this is really a, uh, also uh, advertised as a, a PTRR solution, I think probabilistic TRR solution. Uh, basically, you can, in the BIOS, you can pick uh, your uh, uh, solution to roll hammer. One is 2x refresh. As I said, it's not clear if this is going to be a good solution. The other is hardware roll hammer protection. And this is interesting because Intel gives you a choice to uh, pick your row hammer activation probability. And it's not clear exactly how this behaves, at least according to the documentation, but it does something probabilistic, very similar to para, even though I don't believe it's exactly like that because para does it not on the BIOS, right? It, 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 uh, it doesn't require BIOS changes. It basically uh, is envisioned as a dynamic mechanism that can uh, essentially, uh, hopefully determine this probability and even adjust that probability potentially. Here, it's a static adjustment and you can pick uh, uh, deaths from different deaths, if you will. Pick your, pick your own death, basically. It's, it's a joke, of course, because in the end, you're picking your vulnerability to a, a security problem. Now, uh, you can pick one out of two to four activations. That's probably more frequent than uh, picking one out of two to 15, right? 
But this is basically picking some rows to refresh according to some activation probability uh, choice. Okay, and uh, this is the good news is basically uh, industry is in the right track, but this is the memory controller industry, Intel. Uh, the DRAM industry is actually putting solutions that are not necessarily visible. And I believe even Intel actually uh, obsoleted the solution in the end because uh, uh, there was trust in the memory manufacturers who said that, oh, we have this under control and we've solved the problem with this TRR mechanism who nobody knows what it is exactly. But there are people who are trying to reverse engineer, including us. Uh, and uh, I will mention a paper that was written in 2020 uh, in a little bit. But basically, uh, this work, this initial work, uh, proposed seven row hammer solutions. And it essentially argued for intelligent memory controllers for security. Basically, this problem is uh, this, this work in the end argued that this problem is not going to get better, it's going to get worse because it's a scaling problem. And we need more intelligent controllers to solve the problem. We need better cooperation between DRAM uh, and, uh, and the memory controller to solve the problem. Okay, so this is the takeaway. And maybe my needs intelligent controllers for security. And at the same time, Intel industry was writing papers about it too. And I gave you the story anecdote. This, this work by Samsung and Intel was published uh, at the same venue as we published Rohammer, but they did not talk about Rohammer. Uh, they didn't want to talk about it, but clearly we were working with Intel on Rohammer, uh, so we published a different paper. But they did talk about some other process scaling challenges as we discussed, and they had a similar solution direction that we've been advocating for years, which is co-architecting controls and DRAM, such that these issues can be solved in a much better way. In fact, this, pa this paper is the first that really advocated in DRAM ECC, for example, error correcting codes, to solve the variable retention time problem. And pretty much all chips going forward, DRAM chips are going to have error correcting codes, uh, even though industry was reluctant to add these because it actually increased the cost because some of your memory cannot be used because some of your storage needs to be dedicated to error correcting codes. Okay, but the solution direction, I think the better solution direction is really articulated nicely by Samsung and Intel in this also. Why don't we somehow have better cooperation across these components uh, to actually have a much better memory overall. It's a bit unfortunate that uh, this is not the direction that the general industry took over the course of six years. This, uh, this paper actually was very controversial. They actually argued for many, many changes. In the end, uh, only the error correcting codes probably happened. That's a bit sad. They also argued for, for example, subarray level parallelism, which is another idea that we had proposed to improve latency, improve parallelism, which I believe is a good idea. And these folks actually independently tested them and showed that it's a good idea. And they pushed for it hard, but in the end they lost the battle uh, in the sense that it was rejected by this committee called JEDEC, which is a standards committee, which I believe is against a lot of innovation in the end. Uh, and uh, they could not get uh, that uh, passed. And somehow because of this really rigid interface that is defended by this JEDEC, which is really the interface between processor and memory, in the end, a lot of the solutions were dismissed. And Rohammer was one of them, I think. In the end, somehow industry went into a regressive mode where they said, okay, DM manufacturers, it's your problem. And solve it. And DM manufacturers said, okay, we have solutions. We've solved it. Here is your uh, Rohammer free DRAM. And soon after that, uh, there are papers that we're going to talk about in 2020 that showed that, that showed undeniably that uh, 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 the DRAM that's uh, manufactured that is told to be Rob Hammer free is actually not Rob Hammer free. And we will see that in a little bit. Okay, but before I conclude, let me actually talk about this aside. These intelligent, basically, we're arguing for an intelligent controller. And this is nothing new in a sense, right? Basically, uh, flash memory, which has scaled much below DRAM, uh, has had a lot of reliability issues and it has an intelligent memory controller. And it basically corrects a lot of these errors that happen, read disturb, uh, read errors, write errors, other types of errors, retention errors. The intelligent controller actually corrects those errors and you can actually add more intelligence to it. This is the level of intelligence that we're looking for in terms of reliability and security. And we know how to do this. And over time, in my opinion, uh, DRAM is going to look a little bit more like flash. DRAM controllers are going to look a little bit more like flash in that controller needs to do more. But of course, there is this dichotomy between processor and memory today that's making it difficult. Uh, so in flash memory, actually all of this is done internally almost. 
Uh, so you can design the control and the memory together almost, not always, uh, but uh, it's easier. But in the pro DRAM space, there is a dichotomy between processor and memory that has led to different business models, different mindsets, different very heavy competitions between DRAM and processor manufacturers. And as a result, it's not a healthy interface anymore, even though it's kept. It's the status quo and nobody likes it. Uh, I believe some people may like it because that minimizes their work potentially. But in the end, it's really something that uh, uh, puts a barrier between the memory controller and DRAM. As a result, you cannot innovate a lot between those components. That's why I say this interface uh, um, that's dictated is really uh, something against innovation. But we know how to actually design intelligent memory controllers. We just need to do it. But over time, I believe uh, this hiccup in terms of uh, the barrier to innovation will get will uh, will also be removed uh, because I think there is too much uh, need for it to be removed. Uh, okay, if you want to learn more about intelligent controls for Flash, you can actually take a look at this paper. So this is our first step, Rohammer analysis, and there, we've written retrospectives on it and talked about future issues. And this is one of the latest retrospectives, but it doesn't cover 2020 work, as you can see. We were invited to do, uh, to write this work to a special issue on topics in hardware and embedded security where Rohammer was selected. And we decided to write this comprehensive paper that essentially covers Rohammer in all dimensions, as far as we know, uh, including architecture, including security, including circuits, including modeling, uh, including, uh, like say, pop culture references. Basically, we looked at all of the scientific literature and a little bit of this non-scientific literature as well. And uh, we wrote this reasonably long paper that you can also read. I would definitely recommend reading it because it gives you a full perspective of Rohammer five years later after its discovery. This paper is nice to read uh, as the paper that first uh, showed it, but this paper has a lot of uh, hindsight to the problem after five years clearly. Okay, so uh, basically memory needs intelligent controllers to solve the problem. And uh, I strongly believe in this. And we're gonna talk about what that intelligent controllers might be uh, uh, more and more over the course of these lectures, but I give you one very simple example, para, probabilistic JSON row activation. It's a very simple level of intelligence in the controller. It requires some cooperation in terms of knowing uh, from the DM, in terms of knowing which rows are adjacent. It, it requires some num random number generation, which doesn't have to be perfectly random, I think. It requires some intelligence in terms of what you need to do based on some probability, basically. It's not a lot of intelligence that we're asking for row hammer. For refresh, as you've seen, we need even more intelligence, I think, for retention time failures. We want to, if you want to get rid of refresh, the controllers need to be a little bit more intelligent. So, but that's our, another key takeaway. I've, given, I've been giving this takeaway for a while. The takeaway has not changed for reliability and security problems. And I think this is a very good place to stop because the, uh, now, now that we've covered Rovehammer, let's say until 2019 or so, the next question is what happened to Rovehammer in 2020? And I think there are, there are really exciting things that happened. And that's what I'm going to start the next lecture with. But now if there are any questions, uh, we could handle them. Uh, you can put them on chat, you can ask them. Or if you're tired, uh, we, can, we can basically take off and you can ask the questions on Piazza or maybe even in the next lecture also because we're gonna, we're gonna continue talking about Rohammer, except we're gonna talk about really hot off the press work on Rohammer. Uh, in terms of what's happening with it. Okay, I think there are no questions, so I'm going to skip uh, at this point. I, I'm going to stop at this point. Uh, so let's, uh, we will meet next week and we will let you know exactly what time uh, we will start uh, next week. Okay, take care and have a good weekend.